My name is Neil Brindley, and I'm the uh, Director of uh, Content Discovery Services at JISC. Uh, my two colleagues are also from JISC. In fact, we all work in the, in the same area within JISC. We all work in um, the Digital Resources Directorate, um, and we all work in the, in the content discovery space. Uh, let me just make sure I can advance my slides. <laughs> Uh, and we've got um, some, some information up there about what we uh, are aiming to do within the content discovery area within JISC. As you can see, we've got uh, there about empowering learning, teaching, and research, making scholarly resources more available and discoverable. It's, uh, there's, a, there's got another <laughs> iteration of that um, in the mission in terms of also including this idea that we use technology to connect people. We want to connect people to you know, the right content at the right time. Um, in, in ways that drive forward learning and teaching. And I should say as well that um, within the content discovery area at JISC, um, un, well, in, in, in comparison with um, the other areas of licensing and open research services that we work very closely with, our area is, is very much geared towards supporting arts and humanities. And we, we have a sort of natural skew towards that in terms of the services that we provide. Um, and we're also we're all the time working very closely with, with libraries and archives and uh, those who manage collections. And so uh, DCDC is a very good fit uh, for us and, and, and uh, uh, where we work in JISC. Uh, we work a, uh, a lot with HE. We also uh, have colleagues who, who work in FE as well. So we do work across that space. Um, and I just want to just kind of sort of frame some of what we're talking about here as well by, by giving you a bit, a bit of sort of latest thinking that we're doing in JISC. I think it would be fair to say that in the past, we have thought um, perhaps a little too rigidly in terms of the demarcation between um, research and, and teaching and learning. Um, we're certainly uh, recently, and as a result of uh, our thinking around um, the, in the pandemic and the, the impact it's had in terms of uh, you know, the, the the kind of pivot to to digital and the focus uh, the increased focus on hybrid and and blended learning and the whole kind of teaching and learning piece generally uh, we've we've been having conversations in JISC where we, we're, we're thinking more in terms of it being a spectrum now and and those kind of barriers or fences between research teaching and learning kind of being lowered. And we're thinking very much in terms of uh, those who work in research, but they also teach as well, and they're learning, and, and, and the kind of teaching that they do feeds into the research. So it's, it's, it's more of a kind of uh, <coughs> a symbiotic sort of relationship between these things rather than the way that we thought about them in the past and the way that we sort of tried to design our services to, to kind of deliver to for research or, or, uh, and, and think of teaching as separate. So... <coughs> So this is this is very timely in terms of um, or, or, well, I mean, you know, we want to be thinking more about how uh, our activities within JISC can can support and serve this function of, of learning and teaching uh, with our existing resources as well as with new products and services that we. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, as uh, as a. A response to COVID-19 as well. Last year, we undertook this, this landmark uh, activity called Learning and Teaching Reimagined. And I just wanted to say a word about that before we get on and talk about some more specific things. Um, <clears throat> so uh, some of you may have, may have come across this. I hope you have. Um, it was, uh, the report was released in November last year, <laughs> uh, and it is available. There's a link at the top there on the screen. And it's not just uh, a report, there are other resources as well. There's, there's primer guides, as you see below, and, uh, and advice and guidance for uh, across the learning and teaching spectrum. So, so please go and do take a look at that if you haven't. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, there's guides for senior leaders there. Um, and I'm not going to run through all of these um, recommendations one by one, but um, in terms of word for word, but uh, just kind of pick out, you know, what, what they're getting at here. I mean, <laughs> that first one is about, you know, getting leadership uh, buy-in to affect digital transformation. And uh, the second one sees, says that there needs to be a rethink on budgets. And so these recommendations, they're quite kind of fundamental. They're quite sort of big and, and you might say obvious. Um, but I think that's, that speaks to the fact that um, there's, there's, there's a big shift going on here. And so 
you know, these, these quite sort of bold statements about, OK, institutions need to rethink what they're spending their money on in terms of a, of a logical, <clears throat> sensible response to, to COVID and, uh, and a post-pandemic kind of learning and teaching environment. Um, so then that goes on to highlight some major threats, cybersecurity that comes uh, with a paradigm shift towards digital. Um, the fourth and fifth ones, they emphasize that blended learning is the future. And uh, I think uh, Karen might be talking about, a bit more about blended learning as a definition. Um, uh, and then the other recommendations, there's, uh, uh, there's one about inclusivity and accessibility, very appropriate for um, the, some of the themes of this conference. There's one that talks about the digital skills agenda and, and how that needs to be uh, have a lot of focus on and I'll go back to that kind of theme in a minute. Um, and the fact that we have to keep learning and undertaking research on the changing digital preferences as we go. This is, you know, we, as I said, we, we're in this paradigm shift. We've got to be kind of reflective as we go and, and not just kind of think, OK, well, there's a series of measures that need to be uh, enacted here is it's, it's more of an ongoing process than that it's it's sort of a learning cycle of okay we'll try this and if that doesn't work we'll try something else um and then the last one is is uh, about um more funding to alleviate digital poverty so these are the kinds of um you know, big themes that uh, that certainly jisk has has, has in the last year informing what we do and how we think and how we think the sector should think so um, those are sort of, um, I suppose, more general kind of themes about learning and teaching. And obviously we're here at the DCDC conference. We need to consider what all this means for content and collections and libraries and archives, galleries and museums. Um, so what does this accelerated shift mean in that context? Um, um, so I, I'm going to uh, next be talking about actions to make hidden collections more visible and, and touch upon making more content available. And uh, Karen and Paula will also be taking on these things as well. Um, so one of the activities that I'm thinking about and have been thinking about for a few years really is uh, related to something called the National Bibliographic Knowledge Base um, and our suite of services called the Library Hub. Um, and um, <clears throat> what we've um, been exploring here with, with this work, I mean, that's a set of services that, that aggregates library data and, and it is a discovery platform, but thinking about that data and how it works and, and the complex ecosystem behind this bibliographic metadata um, supply chain has, has been very challenging. And we've been working and facilitating a national conversation um, around that. Uh, not just with libraries, but with data suppliers and intermediary organisations. Um, we've done some work to kind of estimate what the cost to the libraries of managing library metadata is and sector wide, just for the management of it. Um, that's not not necessarily you know, including the, the purchase of data. We, we think it's between 15 and 20 million a year. That's so that's quite um, significant. But there's a lot of duplication uh, of, of effort uh, within that ecosystem, within that data marketplace, a lot of inefficiencies. And what we would like to do with, with an initiative called Plan M that we've been having a, a facilitating a conversation around is to try and reduce that duplication and so that expertise can be redeployed. And what I'm talking about there is expertise within institutions around you know, the information and um, yeah, as an alternative to if we if we can if we can make uh, some inroads into reducing the amount of effort on routine cataloging, so the drive down the time spent on describing objects or concepts other people have already described, as the slide says there, um, then the you know the destination would be to free up time to this, to uh, allow those information specialists to uh, tackle the description of, of more obscure objects or difficult or as it listed there, underrepresented cultural artifacts or, or, or non-English language material. So, um, so uh, you know, there is, there is there's a whole, as, as you all know, as, as people who, uh, who manage collections and work in libraries and archives and, and museums, there are letters and manuscripts and diaries and photographs and drawings and maps and musical scores that are undescribed and undiscoverable here. And, and previously, we've been thinking in terms of that being an end in itself uh, and, and getting those hidden collections, if you like, out there for purposes of research. 
but with this this shift this this big paradigm shift this big kind of conceptual movement towards thinking about learning and teaching um then you know then we need to i think we need to think a step further than that as well and, and align content with curricula and, and when we're digitizing those ob objects we need to think about you know how do we put wrappers around them so so that you know it, it's easy for those who are doing learning and teaching to pick these things up and use them um and and indeed put open licenses around them so that these objects can uh sit on and be delivered via um platforms that deliver open educational resources so so this is kind of tracing back a uh a kind of an initiative to try and free up resource in order that it can be kind of um you know focused elsewhere and and so that we can get some of this material some of this rich and valuable content out there for the purposes of of learning and teaching um i have got some <clears throat> uh fairly complicated questions uh, sitting on this slide but uh, I'll just have them sitting there and I think at this moment I'll take a breath which I should have done after I went running off to get my uh, power cable <laughs> and and see if anyone has any um, comments or, or or points that they want to raise at this and over to Paola who may have been keeping an eye on the on the chat Oh, Neil, I'm doing your chat, actually. Oh, yes, yes, it's Karen, me. yes, I've forgotten, yes. I've forgotten our intricate arrangements already. <laughs> so I'm very interested um, because uh, some of the work, not that I'm uh, talking about today in great depth, but I'm really interested about digital skills um, across all levels um, and how we can support learners in that. And I just wanted to really uh, pick your brains a little bit more about your your second uh, um, uh, provocation there about even if the metadata ecosystem can be streamlined and resources freed up, do information specialists within institutions have a sufficient range and depth of skills? And if they don't, what can be done to kind of upskill in that area? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of wax and wane on 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 this a little bit. Even even this morning, um, when I was listening to one of the other DCDC talks about the um, the British Research Institutes Abroad, and I was I was hearing the um, you know, the great work that they were describing in terms of how they're they're doing their metadata management and how they're linking that up to to um, you know, what link data and and using BIAF and, and identifier systems and. You know, it, it, they painted this quite sophisticated picture of, of how they're working and what their aspirations are. And I was thinking then, well, you know, that all sounds great. Um, there's, there's, there doesn't seem to be any kind of, you know, there's not many barriers or, or shortages of skills there. Uh, but then I noticed that I, when, when the presenter sort of reprised that and she talked about, well, but then there's issues around digital preservation that we still need to look into. When you start sort of picking it apart, you, you just kind of realise that yes, there's a lot of skill, a huge amount of skills and expertise within the sector, but it, but there are pockets of, of it's almost blind spots. And I think that when we did um, some work with the TNA uh, a year or two back to to ask archives and archivists um, about digital skills, um, the view that emerged across the piece um, was was challenging. In terms, particularly in, in terms of the resources that smaller archives have uh, in, in in their kind of their digital capacities, um, so uh, it, it's it's sometimes kind of difficult to get a, a, an accurate picture of, of what the challenge it is. But I think I, my feeling is that um, you know there is a lot of work to do there, um, particularly for the less well resourced institutions, and and I think the likes of JISC and, and TNA and and other kind of sector bodies. Um, needs to should be trying to pick that up, um, and I think we, you know, getting input from the community around how, how best to do that, how best to support that, because it's not straightforward, um, would be very useful. Thanks. And in the uh, chat from um, we have <clears throat> controlled vocabularies. Who should they be written by? Oh. Um, <laughs> Controlled vocabularies. Um, my feeling is that uh, controlled vocabularies need to be written by um, 
or, or they need to be written in a fashion that is sustainable um, and need to be looked after, uh, need to be uh, maintained and, 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 and owned and promoted and, uh, and, and pushed out by uh, you know, a, hopefully a community or a consortium of, of entities um, that, that, that really kind of get behind them. Um, there's uh, a woolly answer, perhaps, but I think it speaks to this idea that that you know it's. I think we've all seen you know proliferations of uh, uh, well, I, I suppose persistent identifiers is what I'm talking about. Different persistent identifier schemes. They've all, almost been like religions over time, where some people are like arts, some people are like handles, and uh, some people uh, swear by DOIs and the, 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 yeah. I, th I think it, it, it needs controlled authority vo vocabularies and, and that ilk um, need buy-in and, and, and need communities to get behind. And to follow up to that is, uh, and indeed, and keeping them current and relevant over time, which takes a substantial amount of resource uh, and international perspectives too. Indeed. Indeed. So uh, time's marching on. We've got um, uh, other bits, uh, other presentations, more presentations to get into. Should we, um, Paola, are you ready to, to leap in and take over? And I'll drive your slides. I am. Through. Yes. Thank you, Neil. Hi. Hello. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm just following on from Neil. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about... Um, a program that we are exploring, we're conceptualizing now, um, and it very much fits in with what Neil was talking about in terms of us thinking about ways of making content and collections more available, um, perhaps with a renewed focus on teaching and learning, um, as opposed to a more traditional emphasis on research. And the initiative I'll, uh, I'll talk about um, is very much about maximizing the use of special and archival collections in teaching um, and learning. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about the program, a program of work that we are exploring with publishers. So it's a partnership with a potential partnership with publishers of digital primary source archives or collections. Um, uh, sort of differently referred to, um, and how we can create new resources by um, making the most of collections that reside in the within the UK um, uh, the library and uh, UK universities, library and archives and museums um, collections. Um, nothing is confirmed yet, so this is very much uh, at an idea stage. Uh, we are going through various processes. We want to see if publishers are interested indeed in, uh, in, um, in working with JISC. And if they are, uh, we will have to go through various um, procurement processes and various steps internally. We would have to make a business case for resources to invest. Uh, but uh, we thought that, I thought that this, this opportunity would be um, a good one to get people's feedback as we are conceptualizing the program. So next slide, please. So what is it? What, what is it? Um, as I said, it's a proposal at this stage, and it's a program of activities that is very much aimed at leveraging the UK universities, so I'm referring primarily to libraries, archives and museums collections, um, to create new digital resources for teaching, learning and to a certain extent research. But it's also about trying to identify a sustainable model so that we can do more of this and uh, lower barriers to content, uh, content creation and content access. And the model that we're looking at is uh, based on a current pilot. It's a current um, collaboration between JISC and Wiley, the global publisher, uh, in creating a major history of science collection. So you'll see that's a screenshot of what we have created with Wiley. It's a collection that is going to be about a million pages of a million items, um, uh, sort of big scale collections of million digitized items. 
from uh, the archives of the British Association for the Advancement of Science and over 10 unique, uh, UK uh, university partners. Um, the collection is available for free to all GISC members um, and uh, the GISC members and affiliates. So that includes a lot of the um, uh, major GLAM organizations and uh, national libraries. Um, and the collection is already accessible. So for those of you, a little plug, um, if you're interested in knowing more about this, um, you can find, uh, you can come and visit us at the History Day session on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, but the key elements of the programs uh, would be that uh, we would uh, aim to work with um, GISC members, so university archives, libraries, museums, and the academic community to identify new content for digitization um, under an agreed theme. Um, that's something that we will have to work out how we, we do that. Um, GISC and the publisher will then co-invest into the creation of this new resource. The resource will then be uh, freely available to all GISC members. As I said, that includes affiliates, so we'll branch out outside of the UK higher and further education sector um, and into GLAM organizations. And hopefully, uh, I would like to look into access for public libraries. Um, after a period of time, so we're talking years, uh, the collection would become openly available globally. So we really have that kind of long-term aim in mind in terms of opening up access really um, as much as possible. And based on this model, um, GISC uh, would then recoup part of well, its investment from um, uh, sales outside of the UK so that then that would enable us to um, put more investment into the creation of new, um, of, of, of more resources. Um, next slide, please. Um, so those are the key elements, but in terms of the reason why we're doing this, um, it, it's really driven by a number of reasons. Uh, Neil mentioned the, the, the renewed interest in uh, online and blended learning. That's definitely one of the things that we think that what well, that we see um, coming uh, uh, on the horizon, uh, but it's also driven by um, our members and what we have heard uh, from a lot of the libraries that we work with um, about the cost of content. So a lot of the li university libraries will purchase uh, these kind of collections that are typically produced by uh, commercial publishers who digitize the archives within libraries, uh, um, uh, the collections within libraries and archives, and then of course, sell it back to the academic market. Um, and we know that a lot of libraries are struggling with the cost of content, because of course, from their point of view, they're having to balance this also with um, uh, purchasing textbooks and uh, expensive journal subscriptions and so on. Um, we also know that uh, of course, there is a desire from, um, institutions to uh, uh, digitize more and more of their, their jewels, um, their, their collections, but large scale projects, digitization projects, as we know, are very expensive and uh, they demand budget and resources. And um, those are difficult to, to, to find uh, within uh, core budgets uh, in an institution. And also something uh, quite interesting that we've heard as feedback from uh, uh, purchasing libraries, is that often uh, there is a feeling that in existing commercial products, there is a strong um, emphasis perhaps on content that is, um, is more aimed at the US market. So there is an intention here of, so perhaps rebalancing uh, a bit some of what is available uh, commercially on uh, uh, with UK content. Um, and uh, yes, and then finally, it's an increased demand on uh, for, for content for uh, online and blended learning. So we want to make sure that there is enough um, uh, there is enough material um, to support the teaching and learning, and not just research area, which of course is more traditional audience for this kind of material. So final slide, next slide. Um, so in terms of our overall outcomes, um, as I said, we're still thinking, conceptualizing the, the program, um, but what we are hoping to, to achieve is to uh, support 
uh, the teaching and learning area to lower barriers to um, access of content and uh, sort of empower and democratize access um, uh, further to offer uh, GISC members and, and the academic community a chance to influence what is being digitized, what is being created, uh, what uh, ends up being in the market, um, and, and, and to support the unlocking of uh, the, 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 the excellent the collections, the unique and rare collections that are in uh, our libraries and archives. Um, and also, and that's an important thing for us, um, to really look at different models. Uh, I mean, people might remember uh, a few years back when GISC used to be a main funder of digitization programs, um, but we're not working in that way anymore. So we're going to try, we're really trying to find um, different ways of, of, of resourcing uh, the, the creation of content in a more um, sustainable way. And final slide. So this is the end. So these are the ideas for our, our program. Um, and of course, be happy to, to answer any questions, but I also had a couple of questions um, in mind uh, where for areas where I would really be interested in people's feedback here. Um, and it's primarily around this notion of community engagement in identifying uh, content to prioritize for digitization. So this program is not uh, just about producing more digital files. It's not just about the outputs, but it's also about devising mechanisms to um, uh, engage with the collection owners and the specialists, and also with the, ultimately the, the, the users, the main beneficiaries, the researchers, the, the, the teachers, the learners, um, in having an input into um, uh, what they feel we should prioritize, what kind of themes and how we should go about uh, uh, identifying content. Uh, in the current pilot with, with Wiley, we, we were quite limited by the, the time constraints that we had, uh, but essentially we put out a call, an open call to all the university uh, libraries and archives, uh, so university libraries, archives and museums, uh, asking for their own um, uh, selections, so asking uh, them to uh, put forward collections uh, under the broad theme of history of science, and then sort of engaged a, a, a board, an academic advisory group to, to help um, prioritize those collections. So uh, yes, Mike, I'd be interested in any ideas you might have into um, around what you think would be sort of successful engagement and what kind of mechanisms um, would work. And I have finished there. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Paola. Um, yeah, I mean, this could be the, uh, the, the start of a conversation that we, we would need to take forward uh, in terms of this work. Um, we, we do have some um, points raised in the chat, um, which you uh, may or may not feel like you may be able to take now, but. Um, uh, We'll give them a go, shall we? Um, Maria Gayton uh, is talking about we're becoming more aware of the ecological cost of storing digital material, e.g. millions of items stored indefinitely takes a lot of energy, uh, especially if institutions download and store material rather than using it live from your source. Can you comment on the difficulty of curating material down to a manageable size? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so let me understand this. I'm just rereading it. Um... Yeah, so, sorry, material, um, a million items, so indefinitely. Using it live from your source. I, I think it's a, question, it's, it's a kind of question about um, almost how to, how to manage large amounts of material and whether um, you know, we can uh, do that at source or whether institutions have to do that locally. And, and Yes, um, I think so. The collections, as so I'm thinking about um, the Wiley collection, and I think in general how these collections work, um, the material is stored within the delivery platform um, of the publisher. And it's really up to, it depends really on the use that um, users need to make, want to make of, of the material. Um, and so there is the option obviously of just working from the platform and uh, uh, looking at material on the platform without having to download it locally. 
Um, or indeed, if users want to or need to uh, download it locally, for example, for text and data mining purposes, then those would be, I suppose, the use cases for um, uh, the, 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 for replicate, you know, having a rep having to host a replica of the material, which I think would be uh, just a, for a temporary uh, amount of time, uh, you know, to, to support that piece of research. So um, I think the idea would be to not necessarily create a lot of um, different instances of storing the material locally. Um, if that was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. And 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 Jane Stevenson's uh, helpfully um, put something in the chat as well. Uh, Jane also works at JISC, and um, she's saying that we do have people within JISC uh, looking at green computing and specifically energy use within the cloud. So um, that's, a, that's a bit of a watch this space, and certainly the Archives Hub is, is working with colleagues in JISC on that. Um, Judy Berg has, has uh, put some commentary in. Um, about when we spoke of the purpose of um, content for learning and teaching and, and to an extent um, research, she's pointing out that the, the uses for learning and teaching can be you know, selected and selective and for research it needs to be comprehensive or complete. And so, um, so yeah, there, there's, there's, I guess there's, as you know, as you're thinking about it, Pally, you know, the different uh, types of um, purpose for this. Yes, you're absolutely um, uh, right and spot on. And this is always the, um, the conundrum, isn't it? Um, uh, can we create uh, a resource that really is uh, fulfills both the teaching and learning and the research use? Um, at the moment, I don't know exactly. Uh, I mean, GISC, um, you know, as, as GISC, we don't necessarily have already, you know, an established view of how a resource would be created. Um, I suppose there are, um, to, to a certain extent, for me, it's also what is made of content. So the content is content and um, researchers might use it in a certain way and teachers uh, might take part of it and use it in a different way. But I suppose I'm thinking perhaps of tools or wraparounds or um, support functions and features that might make a collection that is good for research in terms, as you were saying, of completeness, of extent, of scope, um, that would perhaps um, help make a collection like that also useful and usable um, for teaching and learning. So for example, a few years ago, we worked with the Wellcome Trust, uh, well, sorry, the Wellcome Collection, um, in uh, digitizing a huge um, uh, resource the, the, around the history of medicines in the 19th century. And uh, so that was a massive, massive database of, um, of, of titles, of books and, and pamphlets. And then on top of that, we developed some visualizations that were providing uh, in ways and paths into that, that, uh, that massive amount of content. So I'm hoping that these are also the kind of things that we would be able to work on with, uh, you know, an advisory group with the publishers themselves. Um, but yes, I think it's one of the, the key things to be aware of um, so that we don't create, end up creating a resource that is neither good for research nor for no, teaching and learning. Thanks. Um, and, and, and Maria has just uh, replied to Jane there saying as a local authority archive, we're constantly pressurized to digitize more material, but really it's, it's not worth it for materials which may then be used once or twice. Um, that is supply specifically to each researcher who has spotted it. So um, thanks for that. It's a, it's a good conversation going on there. Thank you. Um, we've uh, maybe got just uh, uh, one more one or two more minutes before we go to Karen. Um, Paola, I mean, we've been working on uh, with Wiley on, on the programme uh, for, for a few years now. Um, and so uh, we've got some experience uh, with this work. I and mean, what's gone well and, and, and what's maybe not gone quite so well? Yes, I mean, with the Wiley project, we're still uh, in the middle of it because of the pandemic and the lockdown, things slowed down last year because 
obviously uh, the Wiley team couldn't simply couldn't go into um, archives and make selections and archives were closed. Um, so that was a major um, uh, challenge for us. But nonetheless, and, and of course, with lockdown, we, they work with different um, uh, contractors for the digitization of the content, for the enrichment of content. So all these different offices and operations were um, uh, closed at some point, um, conservators, um, and so on. So that was really the main challenge, um, as well as, um, as we know, the legality of things and copyright and uh, licensing and making sure that institutions themselves had uh, the permissions and the license and the rights to sublicense the content to Wiley and then to JISC, um, that was sometimes a bit of a, um, uh, not difficult, but sort of a little bit more uh, um, time um, consuming process. But on the other hand, the, 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 uh, despite the, the challenges, uh, a lot of aspects of this uh, project have worked really well. And that's why we're, we're looking to um, uh, replicate it. So we've been overwhelmed by the amount of content that uh, institutions have submitted uh, much more than uh, than we could digitize. It could be about three um, uh, projects like this, digitizing a million pages of content. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that from the Wiley's point of view, they also got um, a lot of intelligence into what content is available within the community, that if it is not uh, uh, suitable for this particular project, that, that they might follow up for other projects. Um, there's been a lot of engagement. We've had a lot of um, good coverage within the community, the, 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 the press, um, uh, so the higher education press. Um, there's been a lot of support and uh, a lot of take up. I mean, uh, from a GIS point of view, members, uh, we've got about over 100 institutions and I would um, encourage anybody who is eligible to, to take up a free subscription to the, to the GIS resource. Uh, nice little uh, push there, um, Paola. Um, there are a couple of more co um, questions. Um, should we just try and get to them very quickly? Uh, is, which platform did you use to design the Wiley Digital Collections webpage? Okay, that's uh, Wiley already has a platform where they deliver all the digital archives. So they just created another instance of, of that same platform and um, and so they can roll out all the different features that they have for every collection in a kind of seamless way. So that's the, we didn't okay. create a specific platform for that. Uh, and the last one before we uh, go to Karen is, are you worried about creating different silos of information when working with different publishers and platforms? What are your plans for that? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, uh, Yes, we I haven't got we haven't got to that stage yet, but you can see how yes, if we did this is very much a program that we want to work on over the next three years, so we might have two to three publishers. Um, that's an interesting point. Um, it, it's up to us to think about that. Uh, I mean, we could do something like, at the very least, uh, enable people to cross search um, the metadata across all the publishers and the collections that we create. So. Um, yes, I guess that, that that's an area that we need to think about. Thanks, thanks for that question, and thanks for all those questions. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, so let's, let's let's move on. I'll move the slide deck on. Paula, do you want to take over kind of uh, chairing duties? As yes, I will. So I'm just going to pass on to Karen for the last presentation. So I'm going to be talking about um, emerging trends in learning, teaching for vocation, skills-based qualifications, and um, uh, and to start with a statement, which is the content requirements of a vocational course, educational course, are shaped by the specifics of the industry it supports. And this is whether it's in further education or higher education. Work readiness is also highly important, uh, though this may not always be addressed as part of the academic requirements of a course. And so in this final session, I'm going to focus on the learning and teaching requirements of um, uh, the sector of higher education in the UK and how various crises and changes are fundamentally reshaping approaches to learning. 
So earlier this year, um, just conducted research to understand the content needs and requirements around skills and vocational provision. Governance for education is devolved across the four nations with the Department of Education responsible for England, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to local parliament and assembly. And so the discovery phase focused on um, regulation and provision in England, uh, but some core findings may be applied more wild, widely across all the nations, and we will explore this in further phases of the work. So according to the British Council report, the UK school system and introduction the UK, it's important learners have high quality skills to contribute to the global economy and future prosperity of the UK. The university's UK uh, uh, report, Recovery Skills, Knowledge and Opportunity, a Vision for Universities, states 800,000 highly qualified and skilled graduates are provided yearly by universities, almost half are vocational and technical, and directly informed by employer needs. Next slide, Neil. So we used government research, including the review of shortage occupation list 2020, to put together a long list of key subjects where there are skills shortages that reach beyond level three into level four, four and six, which is foundation undergraduate and degree, and degree apprenticeships in the UK. We then uh, uh, broke this down further to a smaller list um, before we chose to focus on construction and healthcare. We chose these because both are undergoing rapid change and face potential staff and skills shortages due to social, political and technological factors. <clears throat> this in turn may change the curriculum and therefore content requirements for vocational courses, putting pressure on skill sets, infrastructure and budgets for institutions providing these courses. The first task was to understand the scope of higher education courses in these subject areas using data from UCAS, the university's colleges and admissions service, and membership of UVAC, the University Vocational Awards Council. And according to this, we identified that there were about 400 courses related to construction and 1,000 related to healthcare. So as well as desk research into the requirements of the subject area and an investigation into the types of content being used, we interviewed librarians from 10 universities that have a high volume of courses or are innovating in their subject areas, such as those who are co-creating with building firms or with innovators. So I'm not sure uh, who will be aware of the UK architect and TV presenter, George Clark, but he found something really interesting called MOBI, M-O-B-I-E in 2017. And that aims to address education from BTEC right through to PhD in construction in the built environment, uh, and working with uh, both private providers uh, at BTEC level, such as Pearson, right up to universities for PhD at Northumbria. And we, interested, we interviewed them as well as accrediting bodies, uh, CIOB for construction and uh, uh, National Mid Midwifery Council for nursing to get an idea of both what was happening in the institutions and also possibly at the accrediting body stage. Next slide, Neil. So I just want to put forward a few uh, questions that uh, you can maybe address in the chat and I'll come back to at the end of my session. And so one of the things that I want you to think about is what factors do you think might be affecting the uptake of vocation based higher education courses in the UK? Now, I, uh, we based our research just on uh, construction and healthcare and even within healthcare that's such a vast subject we actually really focus mainly on um, adult nursing but even within that there are things that, that I could see that were emerging such as um, you know skills shortages for nurses different demographics um, but I'd be interested to hear what you think might be some of the factors which might uh, uh, be affecting this. Next slide Neil. So um, I think a lot of us, you know, there are lots of definitions of blended learning. I think we know a lot of them, but I wanted to reflect on this in terms of vocational education. 
So blended learning, that mix of face-to-face -face and digital engagement to enrich learning outcomes. Uh, next slide, Steve. Uh, sorry, Steve, sorry, I've renamed you, Neil. <laughs> next slide, please. So because of the pandemic, this past year has seen a rapid pivot to online. Students have had to either, they've had either no or limited campus interaction or access to key resources or physical areas such as labs. And while many courses would have already been offering a blended approach, the pandemic forced tutors to integrate digital more fully into their curriculum. And if you apply this to more practical based subjects such as nursing or construction, you can start to see how blended learning may have advantages and disadvantages. So I'd like to go on to our, my next slide. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of blended learning for fortification based courses? And just to get you thinking about some of the things, you know, there has been rapid change in terms of people being able to physically work with materials. And that may mean that in vocational subjects, that, that means that the digital doesn't really give them the experience that they need to have. Next slide, Neil. And finally, I wanted to really look at the role of content and tools in vocation-based courses. And in some ways, uh, th this was one of the major point parts of what we were looking at, because we wanted to kind of see what kind of content was being used, how it was being acquired, what kind of access models. And also, who's responsible for acquiring that content? And are publishers offering the correct type of materials? And are current acquisition models fit for purpose? The research showed there's a divide in responsibility within institutions for the provision of both physical and digital content, tools and resources to support vocational studies. The library will generally buy materials that are used campus-wide and will be bought at an institution level. So, for example, British Standards Online is seen as being used across a number of disciplines. More niche, immersive or subject-specific materials are often left to the schools within the institution to buy. So something like online anatomy digital tools, uh, clinical key or clinical skills.net may not be acquired centrally by the library. This, of course, is not always the case, but the accelerated flip to digital is opening up discussions of where responsibilities lie. And acquisition and access models for subject specific content may also not suit institution policies or governance. Single user access to skills based content is more prevalent across providers, and that creates administrative and security concerns. If materials bought at school level, they may not have the expertise to integrate them into the library systems or understand implications of contracts, terms and conditions. Rapid change in these subject areas will require flexible models and agile production of content to support changing curriculum or even access to the physical spaces. For example, do online medical resources really take into account areas such as skin tone? And as I mentioned at the beginning, as well as the academic learning journey to become qualified, work readiness is also really important. So for construction, this might involve access to construction build contract templates, templates that they'll only really use when they enter employment. And there is a there is a discussion amongst institutions as to where that buy should be, whether it should be in the library or whether it should be in the schools, because it's seen as outside of the core academic uh, curriculum. And in healthcare, general numeracy to deal with drugs, dosage, et cetera, um, there will be a debate where that might be bought as well. So resources like this challenge responsibilities and budgets to Acquire them as they may be viewed as outside of the academic course needs. Next slide, Neil. So my final question is, how can we maximise availability and use of content and tools of vacation-based learning? You know, how can we make acquisition models uh, work uh, for skills-based materials? How can we make them more agile? Uh, 
Um, we also need to really look at the greater need to support students in their learning journey as they might be flipping in and out of employment, uh, particularly with some areas such as nursing. So what I'm planning to do is to use the outcomes of the discovery phase to contact to conduct further interviews and build use cases around the content needs and learn support for students engaged in skills based qualifications. To further open up conversations on who's responsible for acquisition and governance of content to identify where content needs are shifting. So you'll no doubt hear much more from me over the coming year, but I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. It's definitely a very broad and complex area. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts um, about a comment that um, one of our audience uh, posted about, I was saying, I don't know, it might just be my experience, but I found that there was a lack of career uh, guidance at Key Stage 4 when, uh, when they were at school. Um, so it wasn't so much about, uh, and there wasn't so much information about what kind of jobs were out there, nor what kind of vocational qualifications there were. I wonder if we, if anything in the research that, that you did um, pointed also to an issue with uh, bridging sort of the information um, between that key stage four and the next progression into potentially vocational um, studies. Well, if my research into um, what's on UCAS and the types of courses and the descriptions are available, even within the two subject areas that I was in as anything to go by, there is a vast amount out, out there. Um, I haven't specifically done research um, uh, into how people are, are moved towards that. Our pro um, prospects uh, within uh, part of JISC, uh, they do work around that area. I think it has been something that has been addressed um, uh, more in you know, in the last uh, few years, potentially, but um, it's not something that I, I specifically looked at for this discovery phase, but uh, it's, we are looking at how we can support students and part of that may well be how can we signpost them in in the first place. So uh, thank you for bringing up that comment. Yeah, yeah, might just be something about working with schools as well as with the uh, um, vocational um, content providers. Um, while we wait for other questions to come through, I was wondering, Karen, if we might just back the track to something you said about the Brexit situation and uh, and whether you have any insights or any views on um, how Brexit might affect the uptake of vocational courses. I think I think I think Brexit and also you know that sort of labour migration. Um, is having an effect, um, possibly maybe not so much in the uh, undergraduate level, um, um, but certainly at foundation level or into that sort of um, FE into HE space. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that sort of uh, um, uh, more skills uh, level as well, where obviously there are, you know, we, we're hearing in the news every day that, um, EU nationals, for example, are you know the cutoff date is coming, um, and so you know and that there are supply chain issues. Uh, there was something on the news um, that I read last week about there being a shortage of hairdresser apprenticeships, which are in maybe um, uh, pre level four. So I think there is a, a real shortage that might be coming in some areas, and it may affect more um, more subjects more than others. Uh, nursing has a very high dropout from courses. Uh, and also we know uh, the great pressure that everybody's um, uh, um, in uh, within the NHS and, uh, and there will be dropouts from, from that as well. Um, so I think all things like that will affect it. But also there, there's that idea that, that there may be a positive effect of uh, uptake um, in that people may be looking to reskill because of um, because of Brexit and the effect that it may have had on the jobs that they had already. Yes, that's right. Um, and I wonder how this whole issue about Brexit and in general the uptake of resources, how does that relate to um, 
the online and blended learning that perhaps we're going towards in terms of advantages and disadvantages? Again, if anything perhaps emerged from, from your research, thinking digital poverty, these kind of issues about access to technology? Certainly. So, so in, um, you know, in skills-based, um, a lot of the courses, there will be a, a literal physical element to it, whether you're in a, a you know, a construction environment, uh, which is a physical lab, or if you're a medical student and you have a dissection room, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, COVID, um, you know, shut down access to a lot of those things and meant that they had to be available online. Uh, but then that would mean that there would be disadvantages to students where the, you know, the advantage would be that there may be more content online. Um, but it may be that that content wasn't quite suitable to the needs that they would that would be fulfilled in the sort of physical environment um, and also the fact that for um, skills-based um, courses if people are actually then trying to access it within their work environment whether they'd have wi-fi in their work environment to do it um, within the nhs there's a lot of firewall issues um, getting access to content so i think there there was a you know, there was more material that was put online. And, and one of the things I did find from the interviews is that quite a lot of the library said, we're not going back. We, we are firmly in blended learning and we want to make sure that we have the content and the resources to, uh, you know, to, to support, um, you know, courses at all, at all stages.